Hi guys, Olive here, here today to review Hidden Valley Road, Inside the Mind of an American Family by Robert Kolker. This was published in 2020 by Doubleday, and the hardcover comes in at 370 pages. This is a work of nonfiction that focuses on the Galvins, an American family that was composed of parents Donald and Mimi and their 12 children. Their children pretty much perfectly bookended the baby boomer generation. Their oldest son was born in 1945, and their youngest daughter was born in 1965. They had 10 sons all in a row, and then had two daughters. Six of those 10 sons developed schizophrenia. Just hearing that right away, the central mystery of this book pops right into your head. How is it possible that half of the Galvin brood would be stricken by this disease? And what, if anything, does that say about schizophrenia? I would say this book is a 60-40 split between the Galvin family story and then a scientific look at schizophrenia. And the scientific side of things starts off with a discussion of what the understanding was about schizophrenia and mental illness in general around the time the children were being born. Unsurprisingly, not much was known about schizophrenia, and at the time it was very much at the center of the nature versus nurture debate. There were questions like, is this something biological? Is this disease something inherited? Or is it something that's caused by environmental factors when a child is growing up? It's also made clear to us that during this time period, issues surrounding mental health were extremely spiky. You had things like eugenics and the sterilization of the mentally ill. And there was also, because of the nurture argument that was dominant at the time, a tendency to blame the parents when a child sickened. This information lays the foundation for the story that Kolker aims to tell in this book. Obviously, with so many children in the house, life was very chaotic for the Galvins. And even when some of the children began to show symptoms, very little was done to acknowledge that. That comes as much less of a surprise when you consider just the time period that they were living in, but also when you understand the potentially horrible positions parents were put in if they actually took their children to go get help. Care for the mentally ill was not as sophisticated back then, to say the least, and if parents feared being blamed for something that was entirely out of their control, who would want to acknowledge that? From there, we go on to learn more about the Galvin family's situation, when the children began to show symptoms, how the mother did her absolute best to keep up appearances as long as was humanly possible. We learn about the different delusions that each child experienced, since they all very much did have their own personal experience with the disease. And also, we find out what the impact was on the children who didn't get sick, particularly the youngest two Galvin children, the two daughters. Something I feel I need to note at this point is that the family story of the Galvins always manages to come back to the two daughters. And it's very clear to me after having finished this book that those were the author's two main sources. While every child has their story told, at least to some extent, the two daughters are discussed at length in a way that other children aren't discussed in this book. I feel like that betrays a friendlier relationship between the author and these two daughters, and he's not forthcoming about that in the book. In fact, the author doesn't include himself in this story at all, and you could argue that it's not his family's story, and so he should have kept himself out of it. I don't fully agree with that because the story that an author presents is going to be ever so slightly skewed depending on the direction they come at it. If you're coming in on the side of the girls because they're your best sources, then your story is going to be a little lopsided in favor of them. It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it is something to acknowledge. This book had me wishing the most for the thing that I know we can't have, and that's the first-hand accounts of the six sick Galvin children. That's obviously not possible, and not just because a few of them are no longer with us, but also to have schizophrenia is very much to inhabit your own reality and to inhabit it alone. I can only imagine what an isolating, terrifying thing that must be. Overall, this book is a mixture of heartbreaking and enlightening. You will find yourself mourning alongside the family for what might have been, what the family could have been if those six boys weren't taken from them. But at the same time, the way the author lays out the research very much illustrates the evolution of our understanding of schizophrenia, where we started, what studies have revealed, what we know now, and what might be possible in the future when it comes to preventing and 
and treating this extremely complex disease. Things I think you should be aware of before picking this book up, first and foremost, it may go without saying, but I'll say it anyway, there are a lot of potentially upsetting things in this book. If you're not in a space where you want to read about those, then you might not want to pick this up. And also, as I mentioned before, this book is a fairly balanced mix of family saga and scientific look at schizophrenia. The family sections are somewhat dominant, but if you're going into this book looking for solely one or the other, I'm not sure how you'll get along with it. The strongest aspect of this book is, ironically enough, also it's Achilles' heel. Kolker obviously had a large amount of access to the Galvin family, at least as far back as 2017, potentially earlier, which again, he doesn't reveal until he talks about his sources at the back of the book. Being that close to the family allows him to see them all, especially the six sons, as people. He discusses them with a great deal of empathy and understanding. He doesn't other them and he considers them the whole way through. But it very much seems that getting as close to the family as he did inspired him to add a whole third part to this book that didn't belong there. I got to the end of part two. I was ready for it to be over. It seemed like it was over. And then the chapters kept on coming. He was going for closure, that's really clear, but the problem was that he was going for closure exclusively for those two daughters, with very few exceptions. He talked about the evolution of their relationship with one another, he talked about their children and what their children went on to do in a way he didn't do for any of the other Galvin children. It very much felt like he tacked on that frankly unnecessary part three as a tribute to the two daughters who gave him the most help writing the story. Pretty much everything that's interesting about part three could have been incorporated in part two. Also because of this closeness that I can feel the author had with the two Galvin daughters, I don't think he properly considered those family members who chose to distance themselves. One of the two daughters stepped in as caretaker in a very big way. Family is very much a priority for her. And she doesn't have a very generous opinion of anyone who didn't make those exact same choices for family. When in reality, it's every individual person's choice whether or not they want to be involved in a family, whether or not they want to be a part of a family. It's not an obligation, it's a choice. And I don't feel like the author properly considered them. Overall, I thought this was a very interesting book with a great writing style and a considered compelling narrative. But those hiccups I mentioned definitely held it back. So let me know, have you read this book? Have you heard about this book? Are you now interested in reading this book after hearing me talk about it? You can put that or any more general comments or questions down in the comment section below. Or if you'd prefer to find me somewhere other than YouTube, I am on a variety of different places on social media and the links to all of my profiles will be in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day and I will see you in the next video. Bye.